The title of today's message is Final Words, Final Words from John uh, 21. It's interesting uh, to hear what people uh, choose for their final words, what the last words that they say, the last words that they'll share on earth will be. In fact, some of the famous last words that were uh, recorded of interesting people, some that you'd know, uh, most that you'd probably know, in fact. Um, I- inventor Thomas Edison, his famous last words were, it's very beautiful over there. Activist um, uh, Margaret Sanger, her last words were, a party. Let's have a party. Writer George Bernard Shaw said, well, it'll be a new experience anyway. A queen of France, Marie Antoinette, stepped on her executioner's foot on the way to the guillotine, and she said, pardonnez-moi, monsieur. The playwright, Wilson Misner, when, uh, when he was visited on his deathbed by a priest, the priest said to him, I'm sure you want to talk to me. Misner replied, why should I talk to you? I've been talking to your boss. Abolitionist Harriet Tubman said, swing low, sweet chariot. And poet Edgar Allan Poe said, Lord, help my poor soul. So many final words. What will your final words be, right? Uh, sometimes they can, uh, they can seem so insignificant, and other times they can be so powerful and transformative. In fact, Jesus, I think, chose the best final words of all. His final days with his disciples, before he was going to depart, before he was going to uh, return to uh, glory on high with his Father, Jesus chose better words, powerful words, empowering words, uh, life-transforming, life and heart-filling words. And in uh, John 21, we get a great summary of the book of John. Uh, Not only the message that John has been putting forth and speaking for over and over again, But we also get a great summary for our lives and a great focus for our lives as we uh, continue uh, to uh, trust Jesus and uh, and to follow him. And so today, if you have your copy of God's word, we're going to begin in uh, John 21, uh, starting in verse 1. Follow along as I begin to read. It says this. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in, uh, in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples uh, were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into a boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Or excuse me, now they were not able to haul it in. That changes the meaning totally, doesn't it? We should read it the way the Bible actually says it. How about that? (laughs) All right. Those interesting amens at times that come, yes. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it, uh, excuse me, I'm missing this for some reason. There we go. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. Do you ever have those moments where you're like, man, I just, I just need some grace, right? I just need some grace. i got to get to a church that's got some grace. Do you know any good churches that I could go to that offer some grace? All right. I need some grace here for my Bible reading this morning. Everybody say grace, Pastor Mike. (laughs) Ministering to my soul, right? And you're helping to preach my message here this morning, right? Um, That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from land, but about a hundred yards off. Friends, we're going to begin with this point this morning, that the grace of Jesus restores us. The grace of Jesus restores us. And here we find the disciples 
after the resurrection has occurred. So remember, uh, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, um, they had been uh, so devastated, uh, so uh, afraid and terrified that they locked themselves in a room and kept themselves hidden. And when Jesus was gloriously risen, he began appearing to the disciples to confirm to them and let them know, hey, I'm not dead anymore. There's an empty tomb. I'm alive. Come, see, touch my hands. Put your hand in my side and see the wounds uh, that I uh, took on your behalf. And and now we find the disciples here. And and a, a couple days after the resurrection, and what are they doing? Are they out preaching the gospel? Are they out so excited for the things of God and gloriously pronouncing Jesus is alive? No, 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 they're not there. In fact, where we find them is that now they have left the very calling that God had on them, the very reason that God was meeting with them. They've left that thing, and Peter's like, I'm going back to my old ways. He's like, guys, I don't know what to do anymore. Like this whole this whole thing has just been overwhelming. He's probably still engulfed in the grief and the shame of letting down the Lord and not standing with him to the end, but betraying him three times. And so he's like, I- I'm going fishing. This is what I am. I'm a fisherman. What was I thinking being a disciple of Jesus or thinking I could follow after a rabbi? Man, I, I couldn't even stay there in his time of need. I- I'm going to back to what I know. I'm going to do those very things. And Faithless as the disciples were in that moment, they return to their former profession. They go back to their old ways, and Jesus finds them, and he meets them, in fact, on the shore. And and he meets them, and he says something very tenderly. He calls them children, right? They're starting to pull the boat in, and he's like, children, do you have any fish? How'd the catch go today? And they're like, bad, no good, we caught nothing, right? Now, friends, don't, don't get offended if Jesus is calling them children. He's not going like, you guys are a bunch of little brats. You guys are like kids, man. You got the maturity level of a two-year-old. What in the world? You can't co- No, Jesus isn't demeaning them. In fact, rather, what he's doing is giving a very tender word, a term of endearment back in those days. And he's saying to them, children, do you have any fish? How's that going back to your old profession thing working out for you? And they're like, not great. But they don't know that it's Jesus. And Jesus is like, I tell you what, you've been fishing on the wrong side of the boat the entire lake. And the fish are laughing at you. They're on the other side and they're going, look at those guys. They think we're going to go to the left side. We've been on the right side the whole time. (laughs) No wonder they didn't catch us all night, right? That's not what the fish are saying. Jesus is telling them, hey, why don't you put your your nets on the other side of the boat? And so they finally lay it lay their nets down, and and as soon as they put their nets in the water, all the fish just kind of like swarm in, and and their nets are being dragged to the bottom. They're like, oh, my gosh, you guys got to help. John, Peter, let's get this thing in the boat, right? Because it's just going nuts. And John, the beloved disciple, the one Jesus loved, who was laying on his chest at the upper uh, upper room in the uh, Last Supper, John recognized, he's like, wait a minute, this happened before. This happened earlier in our days with Jesus. Uh, This is Jesus. He's talking tenderly. He's he's here, and he's he's doing a miraculous work, sending fish. That's got to be Jesus. And Peter, uh, as as soon as John says that, he's like, I'm out of here, right? Throws his clothes on, and he dives into the water, and he's swimming back to shore, right? They're about a football football field away from the shore, and Peter is going for it. He's like, man, i got to get to Jesus, right? Notice what it says in verse 9. It says this. When they had got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. So Jesus is already, not only is he risen, not only is he physically risen, but Jesus is serving his disciples once again. Jesus has cooked up a meal. He's prepared a lunch for them, and he's made a fire. He's gotten loaves of bread and, and, and fish, and he's prepared this entire meal for his disciples. If if you ever wonder if uh, the disciples were just seeing a ghost, when was the last time the ghost made you lunch, right? Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen, right? So Jesus is making them lunch. And what does it say? Laid out fish and bread, verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Now, I love that, friends. I love that. Because that tells us that that grace has the ability to redeem even our failings. Grace has the ability to redeem even our failings. 
Like they are carrying in fish. The very thing that, that is the symbol of them turning away from the calling of God on their lives. They are, they are fishermen, going back to fishermen. And Jesus is like, no, you're supposed to be fishing for men, not going back to being fishermen. But I tell you what, bring some of the fish that you caught. And we'll incorporate that into my work. We'll incorporate that into what I'm doing. And friends, isn't that beautiful about the grace of God? I, I, I heard somebody say that, um, that God uses crooked sticks to draw a straight line, right? He uses crooked sticks to draw a straight line. And, 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 and if you haven't figured it out yet, we're all sinners. We've all messed up. We've all broken the commands of God. And we've all made the, the grave mistakes of eternity. And, and, and in the spite of it, God can take some of those moments that are our worst and our most shameful moments. And he can weave them back in to his plan and his effort for his glory. That's what grace does. That's what grace does. That's why you're st- sitting here today. That's why I'm sitting here today. And, and, and if you know Jesus and you've trusted in Jesus, you know that Jesus is a God who can give grace for those sins in your life and those areas that you've broken and those areas that you've uh, made a mess of. And God can go, okay, that you made a mess. Let's, let's turn it into something beautiful. And somehow he uses it. Somehow he redeems it for his glory and for his purposes. Grace redeems our failings, just as Jesus was redeeming the failings of these disciples. Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were too many, the uh, the net was not torn. Another miracle. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, I wonder if they're thinking of the miracle Jesus did, right? When he multiplied the loaves and fish, right? And they remember when Jesus did that the last time when he was passing out bread and fish. And they're like, yes, this is the one that we followed. This is the Lord. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15. And now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, you, you, don't, you don't see it in the text. We don't know if Jesus did this in the midst of the other disciples or, or if Jesus took him off by himself to have a private conversation. I, I like to believe that he did it right in front of the disciples. The, the same guy who who left Jesus, the same guy whose very words is, I go even to my death to you, Lord. Jesus is like in front of everybody else. He's going, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. What does he do? He denies. And and I think they're back in front. I think they're right uh, around the charcoal fire. And and they're right around that fire, and they're having this conversation. And and Jesus is like, something needs to happen with you guys. You guys, uh, Peter needs to be restored. Peter needs to be restored. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Now, friends, what you don't see in your English translations, what is there in the text is Jesus first uses the word agape, uh, the, uh, the word that Jesus has, has used for a biblical love, a committed love, a love that, that, that is not based on emotions. It's, it's greater and stronger and deeper and far, last, far more lasting than any other human love. And so he's been giving this word uh, new meaning and new fulfillment, even calling his disciples to be about this love. And so he's been saying, Peter, uh, do you agape me? Simon, do you agape me? And, and Peter's been responding, Jesus, you know that I phileo you, or I, I love you like a brother. I have this deep friendship for you, these emotional feelings, this passion for you. And and Jesus is thinking to him, you're going to need a whole lot more than passion, Peter. Passion will fade and passion will fail. And I think passion failed you the other night. 
And so Jesus is trying to get him to embrace the love that he's called him to. Embrace that love that is that committed love, that love that is uh, founded in Christ. And what ends up happening is, is, is Jesus changes this last word when he says it the third time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? He actually changes the word and he uses phileo. He uses Peter's language. And that's grace again, friends. That is grace again. That's the Lord coming and meeting us where we are, right? That is when, when grace comes and, and it says it, it doesn't stand off afar. It doesn't stand back and go, you need to come to me. You need to figure it out, and you need to get it right, and then you need to finally come to me, right? Grace actually goes, and it meets somebody where they are. Now, Peter is continuing to say, I think I'm giving you the stronger affection for love, and Jesus is going, no, I'm telling you the stronger one. You're not getting it, so okay, we'll go on your terms. And he's meeting him where he is. Now, one day, Peter will learn about agape. One day he will have that kind of love, that commitment, and he's learning it even through this lesson. He's going to learn that, you know what, I'm going to be committed to Jesus. I'm going to give my life for him. But here he hears Jesus questioning his love. And this third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Why is he grieved? I think he's grieved because the first time, okay, yeah, that's an easy word. You need some assurance, Jesus, you got it. The second time, okay, a little awkward. Maybe he didn't hear me the first time. Let me be a little louder. Yes, I love you. You know that I love you. The third time, Peter's like, one, two, three. Oh, yeah, that's how many times I betrayed you. And his heart is grieved. He's feeling the shame because Jesus said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Friends, this is a beautiful moment of grace that God has just given to Peter. Jesus, in that moment, he knows how deep that shame ran. And he knows, like you and I know, that shame, if not properly uh, dealt with, if, if, if it isn't met with the grace of Jesus Christ, that shame will come to define you. It will come to overtake you, and it will lead you to do things that that you have no desire to do. And no matter how much your passion is, no matter the strength of your will, that shame will be there driving you, even to the point where you would leave your calling, leave the one that you love and what, what he called you to. And so Jesus is here in grace. He is restoring him, not just with the acceptance that he gave him before to say, hey, come on, bring what you have. But now he's restoring him with the grace of love and saying love is what you need Peter and and this this is true of you I know you to be a man who loves me and he's not saying this three times because Jesus needs a reassurance that Peter loves him no no no. he's saying it three times for Peter's benefit he is restoring Peter one time Uh, you you betrayed me guess what do you love me yes I do I believe that Peter, do you love me? You betrayed me before, but yes, I do. I love you. Yes, you do. Peter, do you love me? Oh, I betrayed you, Jesus, but, but, but yes, I do love. I do love you. Yes, Peter, that's who you are. And grace does that for us. Grace does that for the hearts of sinful people, of faithless people, of fault-filled people like you and like me how desperate we need the grace of Jesus in our lives, how desperate you need the grace of Jesus in your life today. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced that restoring work, that restoration work of Jesus? Grace restores. Anybody uh, football fans here? 
couple a couple very ashamed football fans. I know we're Bears fans. It's been rough for quite a few decades, right? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, if you're a football fan and you've been around for a little long, you might remember the name Scott Norwood. Scott Norwood. Uh, he was on uh, the Buffalo Bills teams in the late 80s and the early 90s. He was their kicker. And uh, the Buffalo Bills went to four consecutive, or they had four consecutive Super Bowl losses from 1990 to 1993. I mean, they, even though they never won a Super Bowl, they were, uh, they were one of the best teams uh, to, uh, to ever su uh, suit up. And field goal kicker Scott Norris, or Norwood excuse me, would shoulder the greatest weight. Uh, during the, the 1990 Super Bowl 25 between the New York Giants and the Buffalo Bills with eight seconds left in the game, uh, they are thinking to themselves, Norwood has made these kicks a hundred times. In fact, uh, the general manager would go on to say that Scott Norwood was the reason that they were actually at, at the Super Bowl that year, right? Because of how many uh, kicks he had made and how many clutch uh, field goals he made. But with eight seconds left in uh, Super Bowl 25, Norwood missed a 47-yard field goal, pushing it uh, to the right. No one felt more pain than Norwood did in those moments. Even 20 years after his failed attempt, here's how he described his feeling. He said, sorrow, I guess, is what I feel, and disappointment in letting down the teammates that are on the field of battle with you. I get choked up thinking about it, putting myself back in that situation. 20 years later, still feeling the shame, still feeling that gut-wrenching move. You ever have one of those moments? If you've had one of those moments where you're like, everything was on the line and you're the one that let the team down, you feel it. Like, you know it, right? And it doesn't go away. Said, But nothing prepared Scott Norwood for the greeting he would receive in Buffalo the next week. Nearly 30,000 screaming fans met Norwood and his teammates in Buffalo after the loss, and many th of them chanting and screaming, We want Scott! We want Scott! Now, if you're Scott Norwood at that moment, you're probably like, you know, trying to move to the bag and going like, is there an easy getaway from here? Because they're going to lynch me right here. It's going to be done, right? Here's how he described the scene. He said, we got back to town, and I didn't know what to expect. What I really wanted to do was just remain behind the scenes, but there was a chant that intensified, and I was not expected to be called to the front like that. I had to speak off the top of my mind, and real quick, I think in a sense, that's when the truest feelings arise. And with his mic in his hand, Scott told the crowd how he was feeling. Because as soon as he walked up to the mic, grabbed the mic, everybody erupted in cheers, erupted in applause. There were no calls for his head. There were no calls for his resignation. There were no calls for, for him to be kicked off the team. In fact, they roared with applause and roared with the support. And he told the crowd that day, I know that I have never felt more love than I do right now. Expecting and maybe even deserving condemnation, nor would, would find a small taste of amazing grace that day. Scott Nor Norwood, in fact, would return the following year to kick a perfect five for five on field goals and eight for eight on extra points in the playoffs. He even helped Buffalo win the AFC title versus Denver on a successful 44-yard kick. That's what grace does. That's what grace does. It restores and transforms us like nothing else. And this man ha had failed his team in the clutch moment. This is the moment that he has been preparing and practicing, and, and everything was in for this moment. Like, forget all the other moments that you kicked a field goal. Great, you got us through the Super Bowl here and there. Yes, we're here in the Super Bowl. We need to win it, right? We need to finish it out. And Scott... Norwood missed. And what did he get? Did he get hatred? Did he get despised? No. He got love. And he got grace in that moment. And that grace transformed him. I, I think if he, didn't, if he didn't experience that, I think every single moment, you see this over and over in sports figures, when they miss that moment and they are heaped on with shame, and, 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 and they, they, sometimes they'll never regain that confidence again. 
And in, that, in his mind, he had no concerns whatsoever the next year going out. Why? Because he knew Buffalo loved him. And he knew he had that support. And he knew that they were cheering him on. So when he got into that, he wasn't thinking about the other one uh, so much as he was thinking, I'm going to make this for the people who love me. And that's how grace transforms. That's how grace changes our lives. So friends, today, you need grace in your life, do you not? How many times have you failed? How many times have you dropped the ball? How many times have you uh, broken the commands of God? Sometimes even willingly. Sometimes spurning God to his face and going, I don't care what you think. I want what I want. And yet, friend, to get to the other side of that and to know the conviction of the Lord and to experience the conviction of the Lord. Do you know that conviction? Some of you don't know that conviction. You're like, no, I just go on and keep sinning. I keep sinning and sinning. I do whatever I want. I don't need. Well, you haven't felt and sensed the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You need to ask the Spirit for that conviction because it is such a blessing to us to help lead us away from sin. Because when you sense and you know the shame of your sin, and you see that there is no ability to overcome that or to change that story except to have Jesus Christ come into your life and go, when I forgive, you are completely forgiven. That transforms. I know I need that in my life. I wouldn't be standing here today as your pastor if it wasn't for grace. And what about a church, too? To be a church full of grace, this is what Jesus was calling them to. This is Jesus' final words, words of grace. The grace of Jesus restores you. Would you experience that? Would you come to grace today? Here's the second thing that Jesus gives, a second final word. It's the calling. It's the calling. The second point here is the calling of Jesus refocuses you. Now, friends, go back to verse 15. Let's, let's hear this again as well. It says in verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, friends, notice what Jesus is saying. Jesus is gently but clearly going, Peter, I changed your name. I called you Rock. And I said on this rock, I will build my church, right? And he's like, Peter, you've gone back to your old ways. And so Jesus says all of that by simply saying, Simon, son of John. Even hearing that from the Lord, even hearing those words, Peter knows exactly what he's saying. He's going, yeah, you know what I did. You see me, right? He's not trying to rub his nose in it, but rather he's got something greater in mind. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. He said to him a third, that he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry, your, carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Friends, what Jesus is doing here is not only refocusing uh, uh, Peter's mind on the love of of God and the love that he has for the Savior and restoring him in grace. But Jesus is also refocusing Peter in grace upon the mission and the calling and the purpose that he had for him in life. He wrote something over his life. He's like, Peter, you are no longer a fisherman. You're no longer defined by your work. You're no longer defined by who you think you are or who the world says you are. You are no longer defined by those things. You are defined by me and who I say you are. And Peter, I've told you and I've given you this calling to be my son, to be adopted into my family, and to be a, a, a leader in my church. 
and to go out into the world and to preach the gospel and to tell other people about Jesus and to tend the sheep and to care for the flock and to shepherd my people. He's like, Peter, I I have called you to this life that would follow after me, that would be a life that would even for you lead to martyrdom. And Peter, I want, want you to be crystal clear. You are not who you thought you were. You are not who you've defined yourself as. You are not what the world defined you as. You are who I call you to be. And so, Peter, tend my sheep. Be about the calling that I have on your life. And the calling of Jesus, friends, refocuses you. It refocuses our perspective. How many of you have ever fallen into the trap of playing the uh, comparison game, right? keeping up with the Joneses, looking at the people next to you, watching the people in your family and seeing those people that you're like, well, they always seem to get the best stuff. And and why do they always seem to get blessed? And why them? And why not me? And why, 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 why? Right? And we get into that moment. And in those moments, friends, the Spirit of God is there whispering to us, you follow me. Three simple words. You follow me. I am doing a work in your life, and I have a calling on your life. And and your life and your calling is not necessarily the exact same as the person I put in your life. And I may be doing something in this person's life and something in that person's life, but that may be very different than what I have for you. Because I am working out my grace and my glory and my beautiful plan in the only way I can possibly do through someone that I've made like you. The calling of Jesus refocuses us, not to look to everybody else, not to focus, but to go, Jesus, what do you have for me today? Because of the grace of you, I look to you and follow you today. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who also leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the staying uh, spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not yet to die. But yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So Jesus and Peter are now walking. And as they're beginning to walk, John is following them. And Peter kind of looks back, you know, he's probably like, you know, like one of your kids who like has special time with dad or special time with mom. And they're like, get away. This is my time, right? Peter's like, stay away, John. This is my time with Jesus. I get, you get, you always get, you got to lay on his, on his chest at the upper, upper room. I didn't even get that. This is my time. Get away, right? Anybody else have kids around here? (laughs) Right? Right. And so and so Jesus is walking with Peter. Peter sees John and he's like, wait a minute. You just told me that I'm going to have to be like led away. And you told me my death. You like, why did you have to tell me that? Now I know I'm going to get martyred. Fine. I love you, Jesus. And I'm and, and, and your grace is so amazing. I will go to that. But what about this guy? What about this guy? You didn't say what his 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 fate is. Can you tell him what his fate is? And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Stay on track. Right. Stay on target, Peter. I, I, I've called you back. I've re-envisioned you. I've focused you back on the calling that I had for your life. And he's like, hey, don't miss this. This is so important, Peter. You don't want to, to miss these words. And he's like, if I want him to remain until I come, if John's lot is that he will never suffer martyrdom for my sake, what is that to you? Is that your calling? Is that your life? Are you the one who has the relationship with John uh, of Lord to, uh, to follower? No, 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 that's me. 
I'm the one who created him. I'm the one who knows his story, and I'm working something out in his life. I'm going to use him for something, but I've got a plan for you. Will you embrace my plan that I have for you? Friends, and, and the calling of Jesus on each one of our lives is the same very calling that he gave to Peter. And John had that calling as well. You know what that calling is? You follow me. You follow me. You give your life. You serve me. You love like I've asked you to love. You follow me. The calling of Jesus refocuses you. And sometimes we need our calling to refocus us, don't we? We get off track. We get, we get our minds on so many other things, and we're like, I don't want to be about this anymore. In fact, that happened during the Civil War. Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain commanded the 20th Maine Infantry for the Union Army in the Civil War. The regiment began with 1,000 men, and by the time it came to the Battle of Gettysburg, he had lost more than 700 men, only 300 left. 75,000 soldiers from the Confederate Army were descending on Gettysburg, hoping to square off against the 85,000 soldiers from the north. Robert E. Lee, who'd won every battle so far, was sure they would win, which he believed would force Lincoln to give up the war. Among the Union Army were 200 men, also from Maine. Most of their fellow soldiers had uh, signed two-year contracts, and after 11 engagements and many dead, they had been released from duty and went home. But in their ranks were 200 men who had signed three-year contracts. Can you imagine that? I've still got another year. These guys are going, but I still got a battle for another year. Now, if they, have, if they left, they would be deserters, but they wanted to be done. And the day before the Battle of Gettysburg, they were delivered to Chamberlain with the orders, if they would not fight, that he could shoot them. After he had fed them, Chamberlain asked them to stay and fight. And these are the words that he said. The whole rebel army is up that road just waiting for us. We could surely use you fellows. We are well below half strength. You know who we are and what we are doing here, but if you are going to fight alongside us, there are a few things I want you to know. This regiment was formed last summer in Maine. There were a 1,000 of us then. There are less than 300 of us now. All of us volunteered to fight for the Union, just as you did. Some came mainly because we were bored at home and this looked like it might be fun. Some came because we were ashamed not to. Many of us came because it was the right thing to do. All of us have seen men die. This is a different kind of army, he said. If you look back through history, you will see mighty men fighting for pay, fighting for women, or for some other kind of loot. They fight for land, power, because a king leads them, or because they just simply like killing. But we are here for something new. This has not happened much in the history of the world. We are an army out to set other men free. Chamberlain would later say that the North won the Civil War because they were fighting for a higher calling, a higher idea, that all men are created equal, and that our nation should recognize this value. Friends, 200 men wanted to desert. They wanted to walk away from the calling that they had. They wanted to walk away from the commitment that they had given because why? It had gotten too difficult. The losses were piling up. The, 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 the people uh, uh, were dying around them and the chances that they were next were, was, was facing them at the end of a, 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 the barrel of a gun. And they're like, I want to be done. I want to get out of here. And this lieutenant colonel, he could have very quickly said, do it, we will hunt you down, and we will kill you. But what were his words? His words were reminding them, why are we doing this today? Why did we sign up in the first place? And what keeps us? And what ultimately, in his mind, would give them the victory? Why? Because they were fighting a battle of right versus wrong. Not just a difference of opinion, not just because we wanted to get what you have, but rather they were fighting for an ideal. They were fighting for something that was real and something that meant 
so desperately much to this nation. And that calling is what sustained them. And that calling led nearly 200 men to stay faithful to that calling, to fight, and many of them to give their lives so that others would go free. Friend, calling has the power to refocus us. And more than anything, the calling of Jesus on your life and on mine refocuses our hearts. So when your friend is getting blessed more than you are, or the way you would really like to be be blessed, and you're tempted to hate them in jealousy, remember the calling, you follow me. Or when you're ready to give up on your marriage because you feel like your spouse isn't pulling their weight, Jesus says, you follow me. Maybe you need to leave a relationship that's not honoring the Lord and you're wrestling with whether or not you want to because you know what? It feels really comfortable and I'm really hoping that this thing's going to work out. And Jesus is saying to you, you follow me. Or maybe if you're struggling because the wicked seems to prosper through their lies, through their cheating and their treachery, and you're tempted to do the same. Jesus says, you are mine. You belong to me, and your calling is so different than that of this world. You follow me. Or maybe for you, the trials and the trauma have become too much to bear, and you're tempted to pack it in. Jesus would say to you today, you follow me. You follow me. Final words are interesting. There's a guy named W.C. Fields. If any of you like comedy, like he's, uh, he's known as one of the kings of comedy. W.C. Fields had his last words when he was reading the Bible. They caught him on his deathbed, and he's reading through the Bible. And they were asking him, they're like, you don't believe in that. What are you doing? He said, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> right? He's looking for a way out because he's like, my life has not been good. And I'm about to go on the other side. I'm looking for some ways out. Friends, do you know the loophole? The loophole is the grace of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus for you. And what we have received in these last words from the book of John, in these final words from Jesus, is that my grace can restore you. You are not too sinful. You are not too far gone that I cannot forgive that sin and I cannot restore you back to myself. Would you come to Jesus today and embrace and accept the grace that says, I can forgive that. I can give you a fresh start today. That loophole of grace is what actually empowers you. It would empower Peter to go all the way to martyrdom to give his life for the calling of God to follow Jesus and that same grace today is what empowers us to follow the calling and to refocus our hearts not on the other people in the world not on how well everybody else is following Jesus and whether they will then I will but no I will because he called me by his grace and friends that's the gospel Jesus came to give you grace, and he calls you to follow him. Will you embrace that today? Will you put your hope and your trust and your faith in him today? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, calls you to be one of his own and to follow him.